Are you normal oh. hair? Okay. <laughs> this is better. To, this is better. This is happens now than ever. Yeah, I. Uh, Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Plants to Pages, Helen Humphreys on Field Studies. My name is Lara McCowie, and I am the stage manager for this event. I am pleased to welcome you to our 10th annual Wild Writers Literary Festival, which is brought to you by Wordsworth Books, the Balsillay School of International Affairs, and the new quarterly literary, literary magazine. Before we begin, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our festival donors and sponsors including the Ontario Arts Council, the NAF Wealth Management Team of RBC Dominion Securities, and Audi Kitchener-Waterloo. And now, I am pleased to introduce today's, today's moderator, Pamela Malloy. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pamela Malloy. I am the editor of the New Quarterly and the creative director of the Wild Writers Festival. And I'm very happy to be here tonight with Helen Humphreys. Um, Helen Humphreys is the author of, 20, of 19 works of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. She has won the Rogers Trust Award, the Lambda Literary Award for Fiction, the Toronto Book Award, and has been shortlisted for the Governor General's Award, the Trillium Award, and Canada, CBC Canada Read. Um, and Helen is joining us tonight from Kingston, Ontario. Welcome, Helen. Thank you, Pamela. It's nice to be here. So last year we had you here to talk about your last fiction book, which is Rabbit Foot Bill. And this year we're here to talk to you about something completely different. Uh, the field study, I should hold it up here. The field study, meditations on the year at the herbarium. So we're gonna talk about the book, but we also wanna talk a little bit about the writing of the book so we can get some top tips on how to write a, a creative nonfiction. Um, so let's start um, with a reading. Um, and I just wanna say also at the end of this, I'll be asking some questions after the reading and then at uh, the 45 minute mark, we're gonna be um, asking, we'll be having audience questions. So you can pop your questions in the Q and A during the, the whole event and, and we'll get to them at the end. So Helen, if you would start with a brief reading. Yes, my pleasure. Um, I will just read. I think I will just read from the beginning because that's self-explanatory. 
Um, I'll just read a, a couple of pages for the introduction. The autumn leaves floating down over the field look like bright, brightly colored birds falling to earth. We have just left the pine wood and are on the path that my walking companion calls Carnage Alley because there are often feathers or blood or bits of dead animal on this route. The victims of coyotes perhaps or the owls that hunt above this field at dusk. Easier to catch something in the open than in the tangled rack of forest trees. And even now there is a Northern Harrier skimming the tops of the asters and milkweed. We always consider it lucky to see the Harrier. So we stop to watch its low silent glide. It seems otherworldly, an owl's head on a hawk's body, the elegant drift of its hunger. This place of woods and meadow and marsh is paradise, my paradise, where I walk every day, all through the seasons. It always seems to be teeming with wildlife and plant life, but things have changed even in the handful of years I have been coming here. Now there are deer ticks on all the forest paths and in the open fields. The toxic wild parsnip is creeping through the meadows and an invasive feathery reed, Phragmites, is choking out the wetlands. The bobolinks and meadowlarks, who used to be plentiful every summer, are now virtually non-existent. Habitat loss, pollution, climate change, human overpopulation and encroachment, these are some of the main reasons for the decline and changes to ecosystems. Much of the damage is irreversible and the prognosis for the future is grim. And yet, I believe, there is still a profound need within human beings to connect to the natural world. How to reconcile these two things. Increasingly, this morning walk I take through the woods and fields with my dog and a friend has become crucial to my physical and mental health. Without it, I have difficulty, ha difficulty handling all the stresses of this world and all the losses that have occurred in my own life. I'm interested in exploring this relationship and have chosen to concentrate on the phenomenon of the herbarium to do it. These libraries of dried plant specimens, some hundreds of years old, seem the perfect crucible in which to examine the intersection of human beings and the natural world through time. Each herbarium specimen is mounted on a sheet of paper with a label affixed by the collector, providing details of the plant and the location where it was found, but also including information about the person who preserved the plant. In this way, the herbarium becomes a place, a landscape, if you will where the experience of people connecting with nature is revealed. I cannot think of another place where it is possible to look into the past and see the moment an orchid was plucked from the forest floor or a willow frond was cut from a branch. A visit to the herbarium is an exquisite kind of time travel. And I'll stop there. Thank you. So in that reading, you've uh, beautifully described what a herbarium is. Um, and I've been to the herbarium that you describe, and it doesn't necessarily strike me as being an obvious idea for a book. And so I thought I would start by just talking about the, uh, where, the idea of, of a, what, where the idea of writing about a herbarium came from. Yeah, well, you know, books for me tend to be an evolution of, of ideas, right? That one thing leads to another, leads to another, and I end up somewhere I didn't expect, which certainly was the case here. So I began with that question of how to reconcile the two things in myself, which was my increasing need for nature and my increasing awareness of how in crisis nature was, you know, all human caused. So... That, that was about that question for me. So I was looking and then I decided it would be interesting to look at nature and humans in through time, if there's a way to do that. And that's sort of how I got onto the herbarium. I hadn't even, I didn't even know what herbariums were before that, but just sort of in my preliminary research where I was picking around at things, I discovered this sort of phenomenon of the herbarium. And I also found that nobody had really written about them and that there was one an hour away from where I lived. So it just sort of one thing led to another. And, hmm. and I decided to kind of approach the herbarium as though I would approach a wilderness. So I didn't have, I had a kind of, um, uh, what's the word? Like a, my sort of, oh my God, completely blamed. <laughs> anyway, my point of go, going up to the herbarium was I decided that I would look through all 144,000 specimens. That's what I was going to do. That was my kind of mandate for being there. But aside from that, I wouldn't put any kind of pressure or any, any external 
thing on the project. I would just see what I found, treat it like a wilderness and go into it that way. And, and that's sort of how the book evolved and how it became what it became. So did you have a sense that it was a book or, or you just kind of went, on, went to sort of on faith that you were going to do the research and it would eventually get some, get where you wanted it to be? I didn't know it would necessarily be a book because for one, I wasn't sure how interesting it would be. You know, I, I, what if I discovered things that weren't all that interesting up there, in which case the project would just sort of meet its end. But, and, and you know, would it, hundred and looking at 144,000 specimens carry me to, through the length of time to make it a book, you know, would that, so I, so I didn't know. I didn't know anything except that I, I had a determination to look at all the specimens. That was the only thing I knew. And that as far as I knew, no one had ever done that. So I was very kind of <laughs> galvanized by that, <laughs> that idea that I would look through them and the question about herbariums generally, I would, they were quite popular um, in the Victorian period. Were they um, on display or were there were they things that like the one at the Fowler and place that were just sort of tucked away? And well, there was that period in, in um, settler science, you know, the settler period, really, where there was a, a kind of craze. Well, I, I think. Uh, Right, in the Victorian era, but in North America too, with a lot of settlers wanting to kind of catalog plants when they when they came here. Um, and botanizing became a really uh, popular hobby because it didn't require very much. You only needed like a magnifying glass and a notebook and a bag to put your specimens and a pen to write things down, I guess. And so a lot of a lot of people who weren't professional scientists took it up. So it was very much an amateur pursuit. And so a lot of people had their own private herbariums. So a lot of the, her most of the herbariums were in people's houses and they were private collectors, whether professional or amateur. And then they traded plants with one another. And this was before field guides. So they often would send their plant they didn't recognize to somebody who knew and they'd get the, you know, the, the affirmation back about what it was. And mm -hmm. some people collected for the big collectors and they were paid for that. So it was this whole, and they collected for, her, for big places like Kew Gardens. Um, so it was a whole kind of machine that, that mm -hmm. was in operation there, then. But it's something that's not known these days so much. So it was rather an obscure subject. And I'm wondering about just thinking about taking on a, a kind of creative nonfiction project like this. Do you actually think about the audience and whether it will be interesting or is it your role as a writer to have faith and make it interesting? <laughs> And try to have faith and make it interesting because I have to think if it's interesting to me it's got to be interesting to someone else I can't just be the only person that finds it interesting I mean yeah it's uh I mean I think I think what made it interesting for me and hopefully what makes it interesting for people reading the book are the collectors you know I found I found the collectors I tried to do research on them and I found I made little stories about about the collectors based on what I had found about them. And some of these people, the amateur ones in particular were really interesting, I thought. And they mm. led really interesting lives. And mm. also I liked the idea, I mean, we have citizen science now, which does things with people who aren't scientists, but there was a real kind of equality back at this one, this moment in time between an amateur and a professional. And some of the amateurs were the leading experts on something more so than any of the professional scientists. So. I like that aspect too, that, that kind of, that democratic moment in this kind of Victorian settler science movement. Yeah, I love, uh, I forget his name here, uh, the, uh, the, the man who was sitting and having dinner and looked out his window and saw somebody looking at something in his field and he left his dinner and raced out and asked him what he was doing. And he eventually invited him in and became a botanist of <laughs> Because he was, yeah. so, you know, that's a, that kind of gives a good sense of how anybody can become a botanist. In those yeah. days. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, there was this idea back then that you could further your situation by improving yourself. And so a lot of people who took up botanizing were people who had sort of what would have been considered lowly occupations and they wanted to better their station. So they were doing it to improve their life, improve their livelihood. Mm. So that was interesting too, right? Mm -hmm. Becoming knowledgeable about something.
Mm -hmm. Like there was one man who delivered newspapers right, at the end, then he, but he did botanizing on the side. So <laughs> <laughs> nice, a nice yeah. side gig. <laughs> So um, you've got your idea and you've talked a little bit about the research, which was kind of phenomenal what you've taken on. Um, can you talk about how you approach research just generally? And we can talk about the, the specifics of this, this project. Um, does it research drive your stories or how does that work? Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of differs book to book. I try not to let it drive the story. Well, sometimes it does, I suppose. It, it really kind of depends book, book to book. I think, I think with this one, what I realized was it's, um, it's a pretty sort of dry subject in one way, right? So to make it as interesting as possible, I was gonna just have to have no boundaries. Like it just, I was kept to put no limits on what, what I was gonna write. So that's what I did. So everything was fair game. I have the death of my dog in there. Everything is kind of fair game in that year of the herbarium, if it has a relation to plants and plant life. So mm -hmm. I just, you know, I try when I'm doing research to usually, I usually do something, uh, it sounds simple, but I have a notebook that's only for that project. And so everything research related goes into that notebook and periodically I read my notes and that seems simple but that simplifies things a great deal I know some people have multiple notebooks or they you know write notes and never read them again or type them up or something I don't type them up I just look at them periodically and I keep them in the same notebook and then I also um, I try to divide things up if it's going to be a, a project that requires different levels of research, then I divide them into categories or sort of manageable chunks and I keep them separate and combine them later on. Although this one didn't need that because it was all, I was just in the place, you know, dealing with the place and what I found there. And so it was all fairly central, centralized research, but so I don't know, it just, uh, I think I have an organized, I'm an organized person. So, so it helps I can keep things organized. <laughs> mm. And So taking on this research project where you said uh, 144, 140,000 specimens, um, a fairly daunting research project. Did you know how long it was going to take? Do you kind of just, or just dive in or just hope that hope for the best? Yeah, I just sort of dove in and hope for the best. I had no idea how long it was going to take. It's, you know, and some of them, you can speed by because there's often, you know, once you've identified certain key collectors, you run across them again, right? So you don't need to keep researching the collectors. So at a certain point it speeds up. The second half is faster than the first half. But in the beginning I was having to look everybody up and then some people you can't find a story for. That mm. was the part that was really slow was trying to, because a lot of these people, especially the amateur people, nothing is, I have to find obituaries just this, this sort of briefest um, fragment of information that I can make into something that resembles a life. So this. And I like this, you know, you had, um, some people were just identified as Mrs. So-and-so. Yeah. And so, it was, yeah, how do you kind of try to track down their identity? Impossible, mostly. Mrs. or Miss, yeah. there's a lot of Mrs. and Miss, Miss, yeah. Mrs. Yeah. yeah, it's hard. Yeah. So at some point, things you stopped going to the herbarium for a while, and I'm wondering about kind of how do you keep how did you keep yourself motivated to continue the pro the project to the end? Because at that point, you must have known it was you were you were writing at the time, and and known that it was a book that was evolving. Yeah, because how how I would handle the research was I would go to the herbarium. I didn't go every day. I couldn't go every day. But when I went, I'd look through the files with the specimens and I'd write down the collector's names and I'd take pictures of things that I found interesting with my phone. And then I would come home and between that period and the next time I went, I would try to research the person I had looked up and, and then write some notes. So I would, you know, on my kind of larger book file, right? So I was keeping a, a running, kind of, I was writing as I was going along, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't have to just assemble everything at the end and try to remember it all. Um, but when I had this idea at the beginning to approach the herbarium like a kind of wilderness, 
I had thought that that's what it would be. But as it turned out, I had various things that happened in my life that were de destabilizing during that year. And in the end, the herbarium became a steady, reliable thing. <laughs> my life was more of the wilderness. And so I couldn't wait to get back to the herbarium because it was this order, like there's these white metal cabinets and then every, you just, and the files are all sort of on top of each other. It's all very organized and orderly and it felt reassuring. Mm. So, so that's sort of what happened sort of about the halfway point, I guess. So mm. it wasn't hard at all then to go back. And um, one of the earlier chapters, you talk about the importance of observing um, with the comment that um, some scientists, like some artists, are better observers than others. And I mean, what you've described in your research project is, is processes is, is the power of observing. But um, can you talk about how being a good observer um, sort of informs your work? Yeah, I think more and more being a good observer is everything, actually. I kind of, I, was, I think that being a good observer and writing something interesting about what you observe is actually your voice as a writer. That's it. There isn't anything other than that, right? Mm -hmm. So you are only as good as <laughs> what you can notice and how you, how you express it. Mm -hmm. So, so I think yeah, but what was surprising to me, I mean, I've always said know that with writers. I know that there's writers who I, I go to for their really good observations and other ones who I don't think are as, as good as, at observing. But it was surprising to me that scientists were the same because for some reason I had thought that scientific observation was more, I don't know, standardized or, or something, but of course it isn't. And I was reading these notebooks at one point at the beginning of the various... Um, some of the collectors who had started worked at the Fowler Herbarium and, and done things there. And, you know, some of them were excellent observers and put in these really, you know, kind of great little ob creative observations. And then I realized, and other people just recorded what they saw, you know, this, that, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And I realized that, um, yeah, it extends to everything. And that, of course, the more interesting observers usually create the more interesting thing they write more interesting thing whether it's scientific or artistic do you think that as writers can observe can uh, teach themselves to be better observers or? yeah absolutely for sure i think so i think to be a maybe a great observer is something innate that some people are just mm -hmm. very you know born with something that allows that but most people can be trained to be better observers i think for sure mm -hmm. so yeah. that sounds like a a goal for any writers in the crowd that are looking yeah. at trying to improve their writing, improve on, improve on your observations. Um, I wonder, in terms of your writing, you are, a lot of your books are kind of written about things that I would suggest are in the margins, um, on the edge of not necessarily kind of the mainstream. Um, can you talk a little bit about what uh, draws you to these sort of edge subjects and and yeah, what draws it to and how you like to make something, you know, kind of significant of them? Well, I think I, think I am an outsider myself in, ma in many, many ways. So I don't think of the people as being kind of on the edge. You know, I think that's more my world in a sense than the main, you know, the mainstream is less my world. Um, so it's more natural for me to, to, move, to move there to the outsider world because that's the world I think I have mostly inhabited mm. and, and identify with for sure. Mm. Yeah. And it's your job to bring out other people in by making it interesting. Yeah, yeah. And often, I mean, it is way more interesting than the mainstream <laughs> world of which we always know so much about, right? Because it's the yeah. dominant, dominant. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, talking about actually the writing of the book, I mean, there was talk the research, but um, how do you do start to did you, how did you sort of start to shape the book? I mean, it, it's it's the collectors had had a lot, a lot to do with it, but um, how did you approach the writing? Is it re finish the research and move on to the writing, or did you kind of do the? Well, I did those little bits of writing after each time I went, where I was you know trying to draw out some of the collectors and write those little stories down or anything that had struck me like I was sometimes struck by things like in the pines 
you know, I was struck by how pines that are over a hundred years dead still smell like pines, like the whole pine cabinet smelled like a pine forest and, and all those mm -hmm. pine specimens were so old and things like that. So any impression that I had had, I would, you know, write that down and as I was going, but there was no overwhelming narrative. And at some point I had thought I was just going to divide the book um, with the categories of plants, but then the categories got smaller and it was kind of hard to uh, think that you know, I couldn't have a chapter that was just two pages long or something. So I needed a different organizing principle. And I can't remember if it was me or my editor who thought up the seasonal, the idea of having it be seasonal, but that ended up being the right the right way to structure it, I think, then I could mm. fold things into those seasons. And, mm. um, but it's a nice, it's a nice way to just go through that year that I spent there. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think uh, it, um, yeah, it's another nice and organizing tool of, of the, uh, the book. Um, you've done, you've taken up botanical drawing in the last few years. Did you do it before this book or? I did it for maybe uh, a year before the book. It's pretty recent though. It's like a few years yeah. old. So there's, but... the book is beautifully illustrated. I'm just gonna excuse my sticky notes here, but um, there's some of uh, Helen's illustrations. So I'm just gonna show that one of her illustrations. Um, it's a beautiful chicory. Um, there's also illustrations from uh, Emily Dickinson, Thoreau, um, yeah, it's nice, nice that you were able to have some of yours yours in, included in there too. It yeah, nice. it was nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is the story of um, of dried plants or herbarium, but it's also a human story. Um, and I'm just wondering about uh, the, how do you how do you make it a kind of how do you make a connection to how do you make it a human story? I think that's where where um, books that it was on a subject really gain their kind of energy. Um, and, and, and how do you take something that is just, you know, it's a 140,000 dried plants and make it into something that people can connect to? Well, I was, I, you know, I talk about the collectors so that they're the human beings. I mean, I wanted that, that intersection of human being and nature through time and on the specimen so the specimen sheet is just a piece of paper and in the bottom right corner, like the size of a business card is the label where the collector writes the information about the plant, including, and then the time and the location and sometimes other information, depending on who they were, or what they wanted to say. So I went to those labels for, to try to, you know, get a connection to that human being and figure mm -hmm. out who they were. And so I tell those little humans, those little stories of the collectors who I can find information about throughout the book. And so I think that really helps, I think, give it a human element because they were human beings and some of them were like wildly interesting. I found some <laughs> wildly interesting. And then uh, there's just my own, you know, story of doing it. I decided to be transparent and just talk about the process of doing it, not be removed from it. So I talk about the process of writing and some, you know, I like some plants more than others. I get impatient in some sections like I just sort of I have myself in there as well in a hopefully transparent and honest way so hopefully that is a way that people can also connect yeah, to, the, yeah. to the book I think those that, yeah those little stories are, are kind of some of them like some of the facts that you know somebody loves skinny dipping you know <laughs> some really odd facts that kind of came, you kind of collected um did you have a favorite collector and one that you identified with I liked a lot of them, but I think I probably liked, well, there's a couple I really liked. Wilhelm Suxdorf or Suxdorf, I don't know how you pronounce his name. I really liked him. And he was really, they, they, he was described as a shy bachelor, which could mean a number of things really, mm -hmm. but that's how he was described. And he lived in the Columbia River Valley and he just went on these collecting excursions. And he, when he had to put the location of his specimen, he always made up a name for the place based on what he had seen there or if he knew the indigenous name for the place, he used the indigenous name. So when people went back to try to find out where his, his specimens or to look at some of his plant locations, 
they couldn't find his Butterfly Lake or his Falcon Ridge or all these places that he had named. And in fact, in the 40s or the 50s, a master's, a whole master's thesis was done on trying to <laughs> discover where his actual places were. So I liked, I liked him and I liked that idea of just the way he named things. I thought that was really, I liked that a lot. And then uh, I liked the, um, oh, I can't remember their names now. Terrible, because it's, it's the evening and my brain doesn't work. But they were a couple of the lemons and they were described on their label as JG Lemon and Wife, which, you know, it's like, what? And I finally <laughs> found out that the wife was, I think her name was Sarah, and she was actually uh, more famous than him. She had she had got California to adopt the poppy as the state flower. She was a um, started the first lending library in California. Like she was a really really interesting person. But they had this thing where they went collecting for eight months of the year, and they rented their house out while they were doing that. And then they just lived in the mountains. They had a blanket. They slept outside. They had a box. They just like lived outdoors, collected their specimens. And then in the winter. They lived off the rental money they got for their house in the summer months. <laughs> and then she drew and, and did a lot of watercolors and stuff and they pressed their plants. And Well, this so. is what I was wondering how some of these people made money and lived. And, 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 and so they just lived off the rent for that period and just lived so um, carefully that they just didn't need. Anything. Yeah, and, and you could sell some of your specimens to the bigger collectors. So there were people who did that, who sold, made, made a living selling their plants to people that wanted those plants. So they're collecting for an institution or for the big um, person in North America was Asa Gray, who had a manual of produce, a manual of botany. And he had a big herbarium and you could collect for Asa Gray and be paid for the specimens. So um, people made money that way. Wow, yeah. interesting way of linking a living. And, yeah. and there were a lot of, um, a lot of, there were some sort of more famous people who had herbariums. Um, Emily Dickinson, um, was that was that was that like a well known um, herbarium? No, that was she was just an example of someone with, with, with who there were multitudes who just had her own private herbarium for her own pleasure and use. And I don't think she she was exchanging plants, as far as I know, with any of the collectors or on that that kind of circle. She was just collecting plants for herself. She had a greenhouse, she grew things. Mm. And, um, and she collected and pressed her plants. And her herbarium and Thoreau's herbarium are available online through Harvard Digital Collections oh, wow. at Harvard. So you can look at their images, they're worth looking at. Hers is really quite poetic, the way she lays things out on the page and really beautiful. And Thoreau's is great also. You also talked about one point about how um, how the collectors, the way they they laid things on the play on the page, kind of says something about them too. Now that was kind of interesting. Like what? Yeah, uh, it's it's a bit like a signature. I think some people, mm -hmm. you know, they rip the plant from the ground with all the dirt clinging to the roots, and it's like they slap it on the paper, and it's just there in the state. And other people spend ages separating out each little frond and root. And, and so it's all del delicately done and, and, um, and other people bend the flowers as though, or, or something or the grasses as though the wind is blowing through them or they put them in a kind of attitude mm -hmm. or, you know, Thoreau's is quite, sometimes there's patterns made with the vines and, mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody's interested in, in making a kind of visual statement. Yeah. Aside yeah. from just preserving the plant. So that's yeah. kind of interesting too. Hmm. Um, so, what what the um, what I say? You kind of changed direction in the book um, about midway through um, and stopped going to the herbarium. And um, is there any lessons you've learned in the process when you were kind of um, stopped and then and then sort of changed direction and then kind of came back to it a little bit later? Um, well, I was just letting the book, you know, the process lead me, right? I was trying, I was just so, I mean, I could have made myself keep going to the herbarium during that time, but I didn't. I just, you know, at the point, at this point, I, I have to say like this, having written a lot of books, I now know to try and get, just to let things happen. Like not to, 
I used to just make myself do things, right? Like, it, you know, it's like write 10 pages a day and then you have to sit there and you write your 10 pages a day. But now I just think, mm, no, if it doesn't feel like you want to be doing that anymore, don't do it anymore. It's, there's, there's, it, it feels, I just kind of, I just do what's happening, right? So, so I stopped my book for a, a good reason because I just felt I couldn't kind of go on with it. And then, and then later I went on with it because it felt I could go on with it again. So I just, it's, very, it's more, I guess, organic, I guess, the process that I, I use now is a more organic process than the one I used to use, which is much more top down kind of style, <laughs> just forcing myself to do things. Have you ever abandoned a book? Oh, many, many books. Yeah, I've abandoned many books and finished them and also finished other books and never done anything with them. So because how of, do you know which ones to, to continue and which ones to, you know, have the faith of it? Yeah, you never know until the end, really. Like, I do know now, I think, more better because I can feel that there's an energy in a book. And if I'm excited about doing it every day, like I can feel there's an energy in it and there's connections keep being made by the material and things keep happening, then I think that that, that book has, it's kind of got juice, I can go with that. Mm. Whereas I think some of the other books that I abandoned or that I wrote all the way through were books that I was kind of making myself write because it was a good idea. I had a good idea and, and yet the book itself didn't have the energy. A good idea is not enough. It needs something else. It needs a kind of magic. It needs a kind of you know, chemistry for lack of a better, better word. Mm. So things are working, or alchemy, I guess. It's mm. Things are working in that kind of magic way. And has, is that something that you're able to determine now, or do you need somebody else to say this isn't working? No, I think I can determine that now. Mm. I think I can do that. I think I'm better at that. Because I think, again, I've learned to listen to the book better and to myself better and just move organically and not, not force myself. I, I think I got into trouble where, when I you know, forced myself to do things that probably I shouldn't have done. So mm. that's like just being younger though, right? Like yeah. when you're 30, it's just, you think you should be doing something and you don't have the experience to tell you differently. But now mm. I have the experience, so. Mm. so I can. Um, <clears throat> uh, the story of, um that you write about in your book when uh, you go to uh, up north to a cottage with family friends and um, you tell a kind of slightly harrowing story of a canoe trip as part of that trip when you were a child. Um, that seemed like a fairly significant, um, had a fairly significant impact on the way you think about nature and, and learned about nature. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's uh, when I was, young uh we some no i think maybe this was the only time we rented a cottage our family rented a cottage next to a family that we knew who had eight children and the father in that family was a geologist and he taught the children of which i got to be included because uh, i was the age of some of his children to ride a canoe and paddle canoe and various things like that but one day he was uh, not doing anything, which is surprising because he had so many children. And I was not doing anything. And he took me out to this island in the lake. And we, he walked me over the island and he told me the names of all the plants that we, had, we saw there, which I still remember. I was eight. But it was really, that was the first time that those things that I had seen and kind of knew that a mushroom was a mushroom, but didn't know what kind of mushroom it was having the name put them into some different place for me. I guess it put them in the place where I could, you know, talk to somebody else about that thing because I knew, I knew the name for it. So yeah, it was a, it was a kind of mon monumental afternoon. I still, I still mm. can remember it all these years later. Do you think that that helped that, that was the, that was the point that you, you had connected to nature in a way that you hadn't before and kind of set you on that kind of path that you've had ever since of being sort of knowledgeable and connected to nature? I think I was connected before but in a, in a different way. Mm. I was always a really um, shy child. I was so shy, pathologically shy when we moved. We moved from England to Canada and I couldn't, people couldn't talk to me. I would lie on the ground and scream. I, like, 
So I think I spent time in nature like by default because I couldn't I couldn't be in the human world. Mm. So I had a, I had a familiarity and a comfort with nature, but I didn't know the names. Knowing the names was something else, and that that, mm. that was I mean that meant I could talk to this man right who was a adult. I could talk to any adult if I knew the proper the name for something. So. I don't it's, know. Such, it, it's such a lovely story about and you just sort of feel like oh i i wish i had had that, that experience <laughs> you know i was out in nature but i didn't know what anything was called you know so and you know and now you know we have all these apps that you can identify which i haven't got but i keep you know sort of meaning to get because it's such a you know kind of cool way of, of learning something about nature but i think um you know starting that as a child may, must must make a big difference rather than sort of coming on to it as an adult do you think that adults can have that sort of same connection if they're a late yeah start? i think i think so i think that like i was always really too busy just having to work and you know to spend a lot of time in nature there's a large chunk of my life i didn't spend much time in nature mm. so it's really only you know that in the last decade or something that I have really spent time trying to learn the names of everything so yeah I think, mm. I think for sure that can well, happen at any age can't it yeah yes. <laughs> yeah I, I you know I'm I'm always really proud of myself that I know what a Queen's Anne lace is and we've got milkweed in our front yard so I'm built I'm solely building up my nature vocabulary it's good yeah, yeah start small <laughs> yeah <laughs> that app is actually very good, you know, because um, my partner has it and you can, it just immediately, right, you can just, you can learn the name, it's quite good instead of having to either try to remember it or take a cutting to the field guide or, pick, you know, all of that, it cuts out a lot of the steps, it's pretty good. Yeah, and I think that, that, that you know, there's always this kind of barrier about knowledge, if you just forget, it's overwhelming, I can't know anything, so I'll, I'll where do I start, so that I can show <laughs> you know. Well, at least talk to my know a few, then I'll be fine. So, um, we've run out of time, so I think um, we're going to open up the chat box now, um, and I'm going to ask you some questions from our audience. Um, okay, so Laurie asks, did the criteria of looking at 140,000 140, specimens with no other framework change through the process? No, because it still remained the dominant thing. I, I, you know, the specimens were there in their cabinets and I sort of started, they were numerically arranged. And so I started, you know, with the first one and just sort of moved through. So that always remained the, the structure. So I kind of, um, my thoughts and my feelings went in and out of that, but that never changed. So that was always the dominant mm. thing. Like, you know, okay. When it comes to Adele, this is from Adele. When it comes to your personal stories and details of your life, how do you decide what to share and what to leave out? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I shared a lot in this book, so I don't, I didn't leave out much. So I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I guess. You have to always worry, I always worry, is this gonna be interesting to someone else? I mean, I worry about this all the time with anything I write. Is this just interesting to me, all right? And, and then if you're dealing with personal details, you have to think too, is this only important to me? Is anybody gonna care about that? But, but this book was partly, you know, my journey through this kind of what I had thought of as the wilderness. And so I just decided to put everything in that I was thinking and feeling and that was happening at the time. And it was, so for better or for worse, I don't know. That's for like a reader to judge, I guess. I don't, I can't really, but I do worry about that thing all the time. I do, I worry about that. Every book I write, I worry about, this is just going to be boring to someone. <laughs> if you're, if you're someone who considers themselves a private person, then your uh, um, range of sharing is going to be some different than somebody else who sort of, you know, <laughs> Yes, that's a true. lot. That's so, true. Yeah, I think that it may be part of the process of, of you kind of thinking as a private person, I'm opening up a lot for me. Yeah, um, it's true. And it might be way res more restrained than somebody that's, you know, does that much easier. Yeah. 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 It's true. Yeah, that's an interesting 
thing. Okay. Uh, Sue, please explain what you meant when you said that you approach the topic like you would a wilderness. How would you approach a wilderness? Well, what I mean is, I don't know what I'm going to find there, right? It's a, a, a kind of an area that's, that's unknown and, and you just have to enter it and see what you discover. It's not something, something without a map or a guidebook or an expectation. So that's what, what I meant by that. So I didn't know what I would find. I had no idea what it was going to be like looking through the herbarium. So I just went into it to see, to see what it would be like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Helen, do you have any advice on how a writer can learn to be a better observer? Question again. And therefore a better writer. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I think? I think with, and I, I sometimes when I teach, I make people do this. Um, pick something in the natural world is easiest, but the same place and look at it every day and write something different about it every day that you see, that, not that you imagine, but that you actually see from it. So a tree outside your house, right? Look at that tree every day for 30 days for like five minutes and write something different about that tree. You'll be a better mm -hmm. observer by the end. That's a great idea. I'm going to do that tomorrow. <laughs> the tree outside my <laughs> that I've been looking for, looking at for the last year and a half. And <laughs> I've seen it a lot, but maybe not observed well. <laughs> uh, okay, Carrie, beautiful illustration, Helen. Uh, oops, I, I wonder whether drawing helps a person to become a sharper observer too. Hmm. Yes, de definitely. For me, it did for sure with the plant matter because you have to really look at it so closely and some you know multiple times right to get something yeah get something those right so so intricate too it's like how do you kind of get those those fine details yeah. yeah so yes definitely it's made me a better observer i think that's really good and that's what part of why i like it mm. too it's a way slow way of really looking at something mm. and, and plus you get to listen to music when you do it, which is something I can't do when I write. Yeah, it's a, di it's a different kind of thing altogether. Um, Helen, this is from Kate. Uh, Helen, do you find the observation of nature functions as a form of meditation? And is that part of the process, hence the name of your book? Yes, definitely. I think for sure. I go on that walk in the morning. It's like an hour and a bit. And I start out no matter, I don't know, whatever's going on in my mind, by the time I finish, I'm in a completely different mindset, like every single time, even if I'm, I don't know, obsessing about something, but just the act of doing the walking and the noticing and things happening is, is meditative and changes, changes my mindset. So for sure. Yeah. And so it's so a combination of the repetition of the place. So there's that sort of familiarity of, the, of where you are, but also being able to observe it in, in, in yeah. a new. Yeah, and there's always something new to see, right? Something new is happening, so. Mm. Uh, okay, next question. Um... Hi, Helen. I emigrated. This is oh, okay, anonymous. I am, am. I emigrated. Oh, sorry, just popped up there. At, from to Canada, from England. Okay, I'm gonna start this again. I emigrated to Canada <laughs> from England too, and was stuck by how very different the birds and plants were. How old you? How old were you? I guess when you into immigrated, I was eleven. Yeah, yeah. I was. I was young. I was not even three, but I went and lived there again in my early twenties. For a while and we went back a lot so so it's not like i came and never knew it again i i came and we came went back and and then my mother at some point bought a flat there and went and lived there in the winter so so it was always a kind of going going back and forth thing which actually in some ways felt uh, that you didn't belong to you know in either place because you're just in this in-between mm. state I mean, the I, I my husband's from England, so we go back and forth. But and, and you see, the plants and animals or birds are different. And I remember we had a, a guest from England, and they saw a robin outside our back door, and <laughs> said, "That's not a, that can't be a robin." <laughs> so our robins are huge. 
compared yeah, to their robins are so cute little round little round <laughs> tiny robins yeah. he was absolutely <laughs> astonished by our kind of monster robins yes. <laughs> <gasps> oh, okay. Um, Nicola has asked, how long was your research? How long did it take you? It was a year. I, I was there pretty much a year. Um, how, yeah. Sorry, uh, how was the uh, the uh, um, Fowler? Did, they were fine? Were they were open to you for you to go and observe and happy for you to look at their stuff? They were really nice. They, um, it's Queen's University. It's a biological station up there. Um, and the uh, person who was working there as the acting curator was really nice to me and really welcoming. And she, she was great. They, they were really just excellent. So the whole experience was, was wonderful. It was such a beautiful setting to be working for a year. Yes, because it's on the edge of a lake and it's in the woods, sort of in the woods. Yeah, mm -hmm. you had that desk there with overlooking the trees. Was... Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Although it's cold. It's, it's climate controlled, so it's a cold environment. Oh. In okay. <laughs> Wear your big blanket. Um, so Van Waffle has asked, how did this project change the way you experience nature during day-to-day -day activities like going for a walk? Uh, I think I I think I observe more. I think I'm I mean, I was always pretty plant focused before. I always really liked the plant world, but now I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with the plant world. I think it really refocused my interest, I guess. So yeah, I'm so much, I'm just I'm, I'm obsessed with plants mm. now. <laughs> okay, so Wendy Brantz has said, one, uh, 140,000 specimen is a lot. You'd only have one word per plant, how did you choose? I only have one word per plant, what does that mean? Oh, oh, 140, so, oh, if, if you had 140,000 word book, like oh, you'd only have one word per plant, how did you choose? Uh, hmm, I don't. Uh, <laughs> how did you choose a plant? I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay. Wendy, if you're um, there, can you maybe clarify <laughs> that? <laughs> um, okay, so we'll move on to the next one. Okay, uh, can you speak a little bit more to the process of finding an organizational theme? Was it trial and error or there, are there exercises that can help? Is polling other people for input a good idea? Um, I, I, I wouldn't poll other people for input because I think when you're in the early stages of a project, people's opinions can really sway you. And if someone expresses some kind of disinterest in something that you're doing, it can turn you right off the project. So I, I, I tend to just keep things to my own counsel for the beginning. And, and if I wanna welcome opinion, I welcome it way further on when I feel more confident in what I'm doing. Um, so I don't know, I think you have to let the project tell you, like you always have to be thinking about how to, to tell the story, like how, what's, I know, how are you gonna tell your story, whatever your story is, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, what is the structure you're gonna to use to tell that story? And I think you can try out different ones and until you find something that works, but it's, you have to let the book kind of help dictate, I think the research and the book, just what's, how it will be told, right? Just there'll be some way that becomes evident. Like I think the seasonal approach for me was of course the right way because I was up there in all the seasons. So that was happening, the outside world. And then the plant, these plants that never change, but yet are, you know, in their life had a seasonal aspect to them. Mm -hmm. It was also it made sense. Mm -hmm. And also books, books that take place within a year I don't know. I always like books that takes place take place within a year. I always find them interesting because I like going through the seasons and seeing mm. what happens. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's a good good organizing tool. Okay, so Dawn is asked: Do you find that taxonomy, knowing the names of things as you walk through nature, can become an end in itself, preventing you from digging deeper into other aspects of nature? Mm. No, I don't think so, because I think I try and look for more 
for more than just the name. You know, I, I like observing visual things about plants and also their little stuff, insects and things that are attracted to them and just the little world of the plant itself. So I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it stops me anyway. Um, so Pamela has asked, the ending of this book was a surprise and moving as so many of your books are. Did you, did the ending come as a surprise to you or did you always know where you would end up? Yeah, this is such a beautiful ending. I love this ending. No, I had no idea I was gonna end there actually. And I was working that little piece that I have at the end, was, I was thinking it was gonna be something separate that I was doing, but then I just decided you know, there's this idea people always say, which I do believe, but don't save things for another book. Just put everything together. Like, don't save things. Who knows if you'll write another book or what will happen? So I just thought, okay, I have this interesting thing and it kind of fits and I can make it fit. And mm -hmm. um, so that I put it in as yeah. the ending, but I didn't know that was where I was going to end. That's a, I love that ending. Um, okay, we've got four minutes and like five questions. Okay. What advice do you have for someone who has started their own herbarium? Oh, cool. Mm. Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I guess, I guess documenting it in, in some way, you know, writing about the plants, I guess that depends how big a herbarium it is. And mm. that's interesting though. Yeah. Um, keeping, keeping some re record of it, I think. Yeah. when you collected like doing something like the collectors did where you write down when you got the plant where any aspect about something that you want to remember about the time that you collected the plant and then anything about the plant itself mm -hmm. it would be interesting to do okay so nicole has said did you learn anything transferable to your fiction writer through this particular creation process mm -hmm. that's a good question I don't, I don't know, because every book, as I said, is a different thing. So maybe when I write, you know, when I'm writing fiction, I'll, I'll think of something that came through from this book, but the book is, just feels like its own thing and the next book will be its own thing and I won't know, you know, so I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess that's my answer. Mm -hmm. Uncertain. Okay. Um... Someone's asked, did you get a grant to hang out in the herbarium? I did not. Self-funded. <laughs> uh, Wendy says, it sounds like a fascinating memory, memoir as well as a story of the herbarium. It makes me think about the seed library that has a few seeds from every plant on earth or something like that. Oh yeah, there is a seed library somewhere. Yeah, the Millennium Seed Bank. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, I think it was just a comment that go ahead i didn't interrupt it no i think someone has written about the millennium seed bank actually a book about oh, the okay seed bank, mm -hmm, where they looked at the seeds and things which would be interesting oh and somebody said corrected me is that aren't canadian robins actually in the thrush family <laughs> yes <gasps> okay um so just a few more things here let's see what um curious about which plants might have not been included in the herbarium, whether any biases were evident to you during your research? If so, what might that say about what we place value on and what we don't? So it was what was in the herbarium, what was left out? I couldn't think of anything that was left out. I think everything was pretty much there. You know, they collected everything. So, and they traded from, from around the world. So you had plants there, there was orchids there from the Himalayas, there was plants from the different parts of the world, not just from North America. Mm. So I, I, I don't think so. It was, um, yeah, it there. was pretty comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, we're almost out of time here. I've got Wendy has come back to explain that it was <laughs> word count that she was referring to in the, um, in the book. So it's sort of like 144, thousand uh specimens and how many, how does it translates that to words i don't think it's 144,000. no it's <laughs> not not at all Forty thousand, maybe okay i think that's all we have time for i just going to have um one just last kind of something for you to comment i um really enjoyed this conversation and i really enjoyed this book as i enjoy all your books helen and i just love the fact that 
that you ended in a kind of hopeful place. And is that is that kind of reflect what you feel like when you're when you're experiencing nature and in nature? Because there's so much now we're talking about climate change and everything. Is it is it okay to be hopeful? Yeah, I think this is what I I think life is an inherently an optimistic thing, isn't it? Something wants to live, we want to live. That it's that's optimistic. And and all that's in the world that's, you know, whether it's you know being decimated by human beings or whatever, or still optimistically living mm -hmm. and some of it very optimistically living. So I think, yeah, I think hope is not only necessary, but like important. And and things aren't, you know, you can motivate change by hope. It's like I think I said in the book, it despair is not a great motivator. So it's not to feel despair. You feel you don't want to do anything, but if you feel hopeful, you do want to make change or help make change or whatever. So I, I think, yeah, I think optimism is required and, mm -hmm. and life is optimistic. And that's, that's kind of, yeah, that's what I believe anyway. Well, that sounds like a really great place to end. <laughs> <laughs> Helen's optimism. <laughs> that's right. Thank you for all your questions. Yeah, thank Excellent. you. There were beautiful answers. Really enjoyed this conversation. Great conversation. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, Pamela and Helen. Uh, really, this was such a lovely talk, and um, I really enjoyed uh, listening to both kind of your journey as a writer and learning more about the book. So again, thank you so much. In closing, I want to remind our viewers that right uh, that Helen's book book and books are available for purchase online from Wordsworth Books. You can also visit our online book table for a handy overview of all our festival authors' books. Um, don't forget the next World Writers Literary Festival events are on Saturday. We have the first Youth Writers Workshop at 1 p.m. and um, Body of Correspondence, Finding Connections Through Letters at 3 p.m. Thank you all for attending tonight's session. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Helen.